Hi, everyone, and welcome to the panel on Empire, Ukraine, and Forever Wars as part of the Plebity Free Speech on the Left Conference. Today, I'm joined by Larry Wilkerson and Matthew Ho to discuss our topic. So before we get into the discussion, I will just briefly introduce our panelists. First, we have Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, who is a retired Army colonel and former chief of staff to Colin Powell. He served 31 years in the U.S. Army and worked as a distinguished adjunct professor of government and public policy at the College of William and Mary and taught national security affairs in the honors program at George Washington University. Matthew Ho is a Marine Corps veteran and former Department of Defense and State Department official. In 2009, Matthew resigned from his post in Afghanistan with the State Department in protest against the American escalation of the war. He was also a Green Party candidate last year, 2022, for the U.S. Senate in North Carolina. And he's also the associate director of Eisenhower Media Network, which ran a full page ad on May 16th in The New York Times urging diplomacy and not more war in Ukraine. So to quickly introduce our topic, there is, of course, the geopolitical situation today, which you both speak about regularly, which include our never ending imperial wars, U.S. bases all over the world, uh, the new Cold War with China and, of course, the war in Ukraine. But the geopolitics all takes place within the context of a propaganda war. And there's always this tension between freedom of information and the official control of information. And that is the aspect of the war in Ukraine specifically that we'd like to focus on today. So this morning's news, um, the day of our panel today about the war in Ukraine is that Kiev carried out drone strikes against civilian areas of Moscow, which was the first attack to hit civilian areas in Moscow. And meanwhile, Russian drone strikes have been bombarding Kiev and killed one person last night in what appears to be a significant escalation. So let's open our panel by commenting on that. And let's start with Colonel Wilkerson. Um, can we get your comment on that? Let's start with um, your reaction to what's going on today. I think what we're seeing is exactly what we put our piece in the New York Times to try and combat or like, uh, to begin to arrest the sort of tendencies. <laughs> that are out there. And that is a tit for tat ratcheting up of what we're doing, whether it's a small tit or tat and it kills people thousands of miles away from the combat zone, as it were, or whether it's a big thing like what's happened with some of the nuclear reactors in Ukraine, which is very, very dangerous. It's still things that are leading to escalation, if not escalation itself. And that's extremely dangerous. Um, I once had an individual who uh, I won't name, <laughs> but who was a powerful individual in the government who really, in my view, at the time he said this, didn't really have a dog in the fight because he'd actually left government. But he'd served three presidents and he'd been in the White House on and off for about 40 years. And he said to me, Larry, there's one thing you don't want to do since we exploded the nuclear bomb. You don't want to have a fight or a war or a situation of escalation with another nuclear power ever. And that's been the guiding principle for me during the Cold War, he said, meaning the Soviet Union and the U.S. I think that's a very sound principle. Uh, it's a different ball game when you have two heavily vested. And, I, I, you know, when people say Russia's not a superpower, I say they're superpowers as long as they have 6,000 nuclear warheads and the ability to hurl them all over the world, including submarines, perhaps the most dangerous element of it. Um, so as long as that's there, we have a real dangerous escalation potential. Mm -hmm. OK, so potential for serious escalation. Matthew, your comment? Right. That, that's that's where uh, this goes. Uh, and what it does is in an escalation like this, it emboldens the other side. It pushes the other side, uh, you know, immediately after these drone strikes uh, on Moscow, you had <clears throat> many, many people in the Russian government and the Russian media, uh, the Russian uh, social media uh, sphere uh, urging for harsher, more aggressive punishing action 
on Kiev because of because of these attacks. You know, and it, this is the nature of it. Escalation does exactly that. It escalates. And, you know, people who have studied this and have written about it, they speak often about the escalation ladder, how you either go up or you go down. There's no side to side in escalation. And this is what occurs. Uh, what is Russia's response going to be to this? It's going to be to be strike harder at Kiev. Uh, Vladimir Putin actually has a very large contingent to his right politically that have been pressuring him, pushing him. Uh, there's, you know, you can read the speculation that this this invasion that Russia launches uh, 15 months ago had a lot to do with Russian domestic political politics, where Putin had to really show that he was uh, the central authority, he was in control, and that that uh, those who were trying to be tougher than him could not be tougher than him. Uh, and we see that here in American politics, right? In our domestic politics, toughness is what so often is uh, uh, what defines a, a campaign. And you look at, uh, you know, I mean, so you can understand those pressures. But with this escalation, exactly, where does it go? Uh, what does it lead to? And <clears throat> you have the very real possibility of this escalation leading to a, an enlarged conflict, the conflict that goes outside of Ukraine, outside of Russia. Uh, and if that occurs, then you have this danger that other nations are brought in and then the escalation continues. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why we put that out in the New York Times, why we work so hard, why we speak like this, is to try and get us off of this escalatory uh, climb into a place where diplomacy can bring about uh, de-escalation, which could lead to ceasefire uh, negotiations and, and, and an end to this war. Mm -hmm. So you both advocate for sort of at least, you know, a discussion, a better discussion around de-escalating. And um, in the U.S. right now, there's been such a strong, overwhelming outpouring of support for Ukraine to the point where um, the country's flag is being displayed all around. And even, I mean, for example, in my small town local police department, last year they flew the Ukrainian flag for several months, which was something I had never seen before in my life with any other country's flag. Um, so my next question is basically about that, about the narrative that we have here in the U.S. How would you describe that? And we'll, we'll go to Colonel Wilkerson first. What would you say is the acceptable mainstream narrative about Ukraine in the U.S. or in the West generally? I, basically, I feel like I'm back in Citizen Kane and Orson Welles playing him and William Randolph Hearst and the media essentially helping the politicians wage their wars. Indeed, as Hearst himself said, I'll get you a war. You tell me where you want it, and I'll get it for you. That's what we have with the media right now, led by the flagship uh, newspaper, the Gray Lady, the one we put the uh, advertisement they labeled it in, the New York Times. Um, I've read, I, I've almost quit reading the Times because of this. It happened dramatically with the war that I was most intimately involved with, the Iraq War, where the New York Times was the warmonger. Uh, that Cheney would quote, Vice President Cheney would quote when he would give speeches. Um, they seem to have taken a tact that the country is very respondent to, as you just indicated. Look at Johns Hopkins University this past uh, week. Zelensky gave the commencement address there, and a very successful address it was, if you look at the reviews, um, appealing to all the things that in this country have made this a very easy thing for the media to do because these are white Christians. Oh, my God, one person said to me, we finally have some white Christians we can support. Let's do it. Let's go all out. Uh, forget about China and Russia for a minute, although this is all about Russia. We can support Ukraine. Um, the media is just hyping that. They're playing with that. They're using that. The, and I, all I can do is say it's the crass attempt at ratings and to save, in some cases, the media source doing it because the Internet and other uh, mechanisms are eating their lunch in terms of the American people's attention. Uh, so they, whatever they can lead with, that's what they lead with. This is very popular. And that's tragic. 
you you watch Julian Assange being prosecuted under the Espionage Act. You watch the other things that have happened with regard to that sort of action by the government. And you see these two pressures, the pressure of the people wanting to read something they like and the media corresponding therewith and feeding that want. And then on the other hand, the suppression and even punishment of those who might want to report the truth. This is a dangerous combination, and it's not the combination a democracy needs. Mm -hmm. So the propaganda machine kind of using all this to prop itself up, even as it also pushes the um, the war effort. Matthew, what do you want to add on that? Yeah, it's a um, <clears throat> it's presented as a morality tale. Uh, this is a, a, a straight up uh, Manichaean uh, conflict of good versus evil, uh, particularly when context is left out, any historical uh, uh, timeline is left out, background is left out, and the start date for the history of this war in Ukraine is assigned, you know, late February 2022. It's a very simple tale to tell. Russia invades Ukraine. Uh, this is a, a tale that is familiar uh, to Americans. It reminds them of the Cold War. And more importantly, it reminds them of World War II. And it has an explanation and a uh, synthesis, a, 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 a way about it that was absent from our wars in the Muslim world. So the global war on terror, whereas the storylines fell apart rather quickly and became muddled and weren't so clear. And then, of course, the lies rose up. And so what we were uh, led to believe about Afghanistan quickly became befuddled. And, of course, with the Iraq War as well, those morality tales evaporated very quickly. And then we spent 20 years in those wars uh, where the government's propaganda was effectively to keep those wars hidden, not talk about them. But this is a war that can be portrayed as a struggle of good versus evil. Again, it has remembrances of World War II, it has remembrances of the Cold War, it taps into the American psyche and it taps into the mythology of good wars, right? Which absolutely is a, 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 a myth, the idea that there is there are good wars. So it is a, a, a tale, I think, that the, the major media outlets have so readily uh, uh rush to because these are stories that people want to read these are stories that people want to hear these are stories that make people feel good about the united states and its role in it and of course you have all the uh add-ons to that the relationships to the weapons companies the relationship to the fossil fuel industries all the things that brought this war about and sustain it well, that's all on the aside. The main thing that can be spoken about in this war through the mainstream media, again, is this morality tale, which makes for uh, an easy way to sell the war and an even easier way to beat down any dissent against it. Mm -hmm. So there's this, there's a portion of the American population who will just eat all that propaganda up because, as you pointed out, it speaks to some kind of deeper value they hold or a myth they believe in or something. Um, but for people who genuinely want to know the truth and just the truth, how can we parse um, disinformation from, you know, just genuine attempts to seek the truth? We have, as you both pointed out, mainstream platforms pumping out this narrative. Um, and then we have them also saying to be wary of disinformation and to be wary of independent media. So how do we actually try to differentiate between disinformation and alternative sources of seeking the truth or attempting to? Let Colonel add, Wilkerson? Yeah, let me add something to what Matt said there. Um, increasingly, as, as I'm checking the data, we are not winning over the hearts and minds of the global community. As a matter of fact, because of OFAC's official list of 32 countries, I think it's more like about 60 countries, indirect and direct sanctions, of countries that we are really hurting. I mean, really hurting with sanctions, draconian sanctions. Um, those people don't particularly care for us. And if you add up those countries, 
It's about two and a half to three billion people, depending on which countries you put in the list. Just the OFAC's list is about 2.8 billion. So uh, that's the Office of Financial Assets Control that more or less looks mm -hmm. over our sanctions and manages them. Um, these people aren't necessarily in sync with us on Ukraine, and they certainly aren't in sync with us on our neglect of the climate crisis and what it's doing to them already. Um, they see us as the guilty parties here. We have produce this crisis and aren't doing anything really substantial to help them. I was on a webinar yesterday about the $11 billion that Joe Biden promised to help the global South, so to speak. <laughs> One billion has been allocated and almost none of it's been spent. They know this. They track this stuff. So this is not helping us really with this considerable portion of the world that is beginning to distance itself from our policies and even to abhor our policies. And Ukraine to them is not an issue that is of concern. Not when you have war in the Sudan, you have war in Eritrea and Ethiopia, now war in, in Somalia, probably our fault too, because we've militarized Somalia. War all across the Sahel with the Wagner Group participating and the French having deserted it. The only place they're left is Cote d'Ivoire. So the rest of the world, so to speak, a, a sizable portion of it, doesn't look on Ukraine the way the American public does. And this is growing dangerous, too, because we are losing much of the world. And who are we losing it to? And I'm not one for wanting war with China, but basically we're losing that part of the world to China because China is very astute and is picking that up and doing what it can to win and influence the hearts and minds and such of those people who are abandoning us. Not a good time for the empire, all in all. Mm -hmm. So internally, we may have you know, this overwhelming support for Ukraine. But from the outside, we're looking like the bad guys, as you say. Except for Europe. Uh, and I don't think that's going to last because mm -hmm. a huge component of what we're doing, a huge component of what we're doing is, and it's in some desperation, to try and reestablish U.S. economic hegemony over Europe. Germany particularly, the motor of Europe, if you will, was turning more and more to China. Um, indeed, Ukraine was planned to be an interpol for China's space road initiative. It was going to be the interpol for China's initiative ending in that portion of Europe. And that's been terminated more or less by what's happening. And that was our purpose. That was our economic purpose. And pretty soon the Europeans will figure this out. The Germans are not stupid. They'll figure this out. They'll get rid of the governments that we largely have engineered to include the Secretary General of NATO, whom we got into where he is, very torturous process. I was present at the beginning when we started it. We put him into position. These governments and these institutions and their individual leadership are our product, and they are going to go away as the Europeans grow increasingly discontented with U.S. re-establishment of its economic and other hegemony over Europe. I think it'll take a year, maybe two, and then you're going to see a rupture in the transatlantic alliance. And Ukraine is going to be a part of that rupture, while today everybody's saying it's a unifier. It mm -hmm. isn't, not ultimately. Mm -hmm. And do you think that once that happens, do you think that internally in the center of the empire, people will still continue to believe these myths about our role? Or will people kind of um, wake up to that? We could go back to Matthew for now. Well, I mean, to, to your initial question, Sasha, about um, how do you find the information? It's a lot of work. And, you know, both Larry and I do this full time. And that's what we spend our time doing. You have to, uh, I, I could say in the 30 years that I've been doing this professionally, roughly, and, and Larry, you know, longer in your, your case, right? I've never seen anything like this in terms of the propaganda, in terms of the amount of work you have to put in to assemble that Venn diagram where you can see the truth, where you can take all these different sources and, okay, here's where they overlap, okay, and this is what's consistent. You know, and the other thing, too, is the type of, 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 of media we have these days where it's so heavily invested in telling the story of that day. And so the, the idea that you're going to miss the forest for the trees that you're all going to get it all caught up in what happened today in Ukraine uh, versus what the trends are. 
You know, what's been happening these last several months? What's, what does it look like for these last 15 months? Okay, that tells you where it's going. And that's a lot of work to do that. So it's very easy for people to be misled, for people to be manipulated. Again, the, the whole uh, storyline of this war is a very emotional one. So it's very easy to, to uh, uh, you know, pull people the direction you want them to. And I mean, I have conversations with friends of mine, fellow veterans about this war, and they feel uh, in their knowledge might not be that, that uh, deep on it uh, as they would like. And they'll say flat out, like, this war makes me feel good. This is a war that like, I, I feel like I could take part in. And then when they get more background on it, more history, then they say, well, that doesn't make much sense, or that doesn't seem right, or, oh, no, you're absolutely right. Where, where is this heading to? You're absolutely right. There's no way the Ukrainian military can win this conflict. There's no way that the Ukrainian army can remove the Russian army from its territory. It's just not going to happen without a NATO army. And I mean, an actual NATO army, three to five core of, of mechanized infantry and armor units coming into Ukraine is going to get Russia out. And if that's the case, then why do you prolong this? Why do you continue with this? If the, if they're, you know, if your entire strategy is almost if it's built upon some faraway hope. And, you know, but that is a, a conclusion that you come to only by really digging into it, understanding it, reading and watching lots of different sources. And, you know, and, and the problem is too, because, because again, it's heavily propagandized on all sides. Uh, I mean, the stuff coming out of Russia is just as bad as the stuff coming out of Kiev. So you, you can't, how do you tell what is the actual ground truth? And again, that takes time, that takes effort. You have to to sit and watch and notice the trends. Um, but the the uh, to Larry's point though, where I think you've seen the, the, a uh, world outside of Europe and the US and I guess Korea and Japan and Australia, um, their rejection of the US, the US role in the world, the idea of this unipolar world, uh, the, the, the notion that they have to pick a side, that comes not just from being told you have to follow us on this Ukraine war. That comes from decades and decades, particularly since the end of the Cold War for the last three decades, of an American uh, uh, abuse, American lecturing, American military uh, adventurism. You know, there's a quote, and I, I can't remember which which African leader said this, but he said, you know, when when you when you talk to the Chinese, uh, you you end up getting a port or some roads or a new hospital. When you talk to the Americans, you get a lecture, and they offer to put commandos and drones in your country. I mean, so that's basically what we've been, we've been, how we've been acting the last decades. And so if, I think if you look at how the international uh, community is viewing the war in Ukraine, and, and to Larry's point, they're not being supportive of, of the U.S. US policies. Uh, they've not jumped on board with the sanctions. Um, they are not roundly condemning. They are not uh, following in line with the U United States' military victory policy for Ukraine, right? So they're urging negotiations. You're seeing things, uh, you know, on a separate line, but it all comes to the same point, this notion of sanctions, particularly. You saw President Lula of Brazil uh, the other day uh, castigating the Americans for uh, what they've done to Venezuela. Uh, so the I think that the, the where the U.S. wants to be the leader uh, and feels that its leadership is something that's entitled to them because it won the Cold War. Well, that's three decades gone now. And all the sanctions, all the wars have forced other countries to say, look, if we align ourselves with the U.S., this is where it's going to take us to. And so I think that that astute kind of understanding of where U.S. policy leads is why so many nations have decided that Ukraine is not something we're going to be on board with the United States and its partners in Europe and in, in, in Asia, uh, you know, because it doesn't make any sense to us. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting to hear you say um, that you had fellow veterans who said this is a war they could feel good about. And it is, it's a sentiment I've heard from, you know, friends, other Americans who they that's kind of how they felt. They thought, you know, there's so many things dividing us right now. And this is something that can actually unite us as Americans. And I was a little surprised to hear that from certain certain people I know, especially considering you know, and this is the free speech conference. And these are friends who I talk about free speech with all the time and other issues that might be might get them criticized um, by the mainstream sort of narratives. But this one, it seems 
so many people are just fully on board for it. Um, and then I do want to go to Colonel Wilkerson about that, about the disinformation topic. And I'll just add, do you think that the kind of the term disinformation itself or the the propaganda we get that tells us, you know, don't read certain things, don't look at certain sources, do they use the word disinformation to actually bolster their own narrative? I mean, and then, you know, certainly is there also a danger of real misinformation or disinformation? I'll tell you a story. <laughs> you can believe it or not. <laughs> it's true. In 2002, I dispatched one of Colin Powell's speechwriters whom he was dissatisfied with. He'd been a speechwriter for Ronald Reagan and was constantly claiming he coined the phrase evil empire. I don't know who actually did that, but I don't think it was this particular individual. But he was a pretty good speechwriter, except he was very, very neoconservative-like in his interpretation of policy issues. And Powell was not that way. And so I sent him to DOD. Well, he became a spy for me because I sent him off with grace and favor. I didn't you know, say you're fired. I just sent him off. He tells me a story one day about Admiral John Poindexter, who you may remember was involved in Iran-Contra and was actually, I think, reduced one grade from Vice Admiral to Rear Admiral because of his participation in Iran-Contra. He was National Security Advisor for Ronald Reagan at the time of six that Reagan had. Um, John was in an office called Strategic Information Operations in the Pentagon. And the moment this individual related this to me, took me back to my moments in the Pentagon when I had vehemently objected to propagandizing the American people. I had done it within the PA office of the Pentagon with the Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs and all across the Joint Staff. I thought I'd been reasonably successful, and I thought my boss at the time, Colin Powell, had been reasonably successful in tamping this down. Well, here I'm learning that John Poindexter is running an office in the Pentagon called Strategic Information Office uh, Operations, expressly aimed at propagandizing the American people and using such techniques as putting articles on the internet in English, that should give you an indicator, in Baghdad or in Sydney or in Tokyo or wherever, and then propagating them back over the internet into the United States and using them throughout the United States to propagandize the American people. Maybe it wasn't technically propaganda when it was given to Iraqis or it was given to Australians, but it was damn sure propaganda in the domestic audience. And there's a law against that. And so Rumsfeld is compelled to go over to the Senate Armed Services Committee and reveal what he's doing. Well, as soon as he does, the senators who know the law, well, there are a few left, jump up and tell him stop it immediately. Okay, I find out that the Congress has so instructed the Secretary of Defense and think the issue is perhaps settled. A couple of weeks later, I get a call from Tony, and he says Rumsfeld came back and changed the sign on the door of Admiral Poindexter from SIO to IO. So it went from strategic information operations to information warfare, which was copacetic, honest, and decent. But they kept on propagandizing the American people, and I will tell you they've been doing it ever since. Now, this is just the Pentagon, a major effort to sell the wars because they realized, some of them, that Vietnam was in part, in their view, lost because they didn't capture the media and make it molded to their wishes. Never again would that happen. So there's this strong effort in the Pentagon still to do this. I suspect it's elsewhere in the government. Mm -hmm. Matthew, do you want to add to that? I mean, I think a lot of it has to do that we lose our failure to understand the other side. You know, there's stories from American veterans of the wars in Europe that the shock they had when coming across the German soldier that is killed, realizing that soldier had a belt buckle that said, you know, Gott mit uns, you know, God is with us. You know, this idea that how could God, how could they feel that God is with them? I mean, they're an evil side. What we're doing here, we're fighting against evil. How could these people think God is with them? You know, and you see that in memoirs, both, uh, you know, from American veterans, kind of this, this shock at this uh, reality faced with this notion that maybe the other side is like us. 
maybe you know so that we have to understand i mean one of the things we look at uh in in as we mentioned before this advertisement we placed in in the new york times uh what we did with the two things one we had a text of course uh arguing basically about the diplomatic malpractice that had occurred for decades uh the absence of diplomacy that led to war and the need of diplomacy to end the war but then also too we included a timeline of events leading up to uh, Russia's invasion, as well as concluding a map. And the map was a map uh, twofold. One that showed what uh, it looks like when you fill in all the bases in Europe, North Africa, uh, uh, West Asia, uh, uh, NATO bases that surround Russia. And then we did a second map where we imagined what would it look like if Russian bases were surrounding the U.S.? So you have bases all through Canada, all through Mexico, all through the Caribbean. What would that look like? And we simply titled that, what, what if the shoe were on the other foot? So this ability to see the perspective of your adversary, of your enemy, you know, of your opponent, your, your, your competition, you know, concept is called strategic empathy. Uh, one of the first things that Larry and I were taught as, you know, Larry as an army officer, as a Marine Corps officer, is that you put yourself in perspective of the enemy. So if you dig a fortification, if you build a fort, so to say, or trenches, you need to go out and look at it from the enemy's perspective. If you're right in what's called an operation order in the Marine Corps or the Army, really the second thing after saying what you want to do, what the purpose is, the second thing is to put what is the enemy's most likely course of action and the enemy's most dangerous course of action. Not how many troops you have, not how many bullets you need, not what you're going to do or how you're going to do it. That's how important it is to understand the other side. It's primary. It, it, you can't get away from that. And so I think as we talk about the propaganda and how it's effective here in the U.S., we have to also realize how effective that propaganda is in Russia. And so you brought up my veteran friends who feel like, whoa, this is a war I could I could be part of, unlike what we did in Iraq and Afghanistan, where I didn't believe in what we're doing here. It's clear cut. Well, if you were to put them in the same perspective as Russians, I think their attitudes would be similar. And I think the numbers we hear about support of the war in Russia are true. I think the popularity of Vladimir Putin at 70% or so is accurate. If you look and see how the Russian government ha and the Russian media, it's a controlled media, how they have been portraying this war, they describe it as a war of self-defense. And if you say you look at uh, the Russian military recruiting ads that they're utilizing right now, those same ads, if used in the United States, would be very effective, right? Challenging young men, basically, will you take up weapons to defend your country? Are you going to defend your family and your community? You know, just as your great-great-grandfather defended against Napoleon, just as your great-grandfather fought against the Kaiser, your grandfather fought against uh, Hitler, we need you now to defend your homeland. I mean, so the propaganda has to be understood for, by both sides. Uh, and how effective it is in, in its usage. Uh, and th th that nut to crack then, of course, is very difficult, but this is the reason why we have conversations like this. And this the hope I have for it is the fact that we have technology that allows us to do these things. 10 years ago, five years ago, this might not have been possible to do a forum like this. And so that's where I get my hope is that, you know, the more we communicate with each other, the more we can we can disassemble that propaganda that's used by both sides for their purposes. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you just to add, you asked mm -hmm. the question previously and then your your uh, questions that you sent ahead of time. Um, there are people out there who are doing exactly what Matthew has just described. Now, John Mearsheimer might not be accurate, I think, personally, and I've said this to John on occasion, that he is a little bit too enraptured with his theoretical constructs of realism. And he can't get out of those constructs. That's typical academic, though. I know I was one. <laughs> but you can listen to him. And John basically gives this description of the other side, if you will, that we tried to portray in our New York Times piece. And I think is accurate. And so there are voices out there. There are very scholarly, trained, educated voices out there saying what the realities are, I think, much closer than what our media is. So it's not like there's a dearth, a total dearth of information for people. It's just not mm -hmm. the sexy information. <laughs> right. And it's not usually not in the New York Times, right? Yeah. So yeah. unless 
people like you sort of get it in there on a on a rare occasion. But um, what about sort of if something is the same as Russian propaganda, does that mean we have to instantly dismiss it? Like, for, for example, the idea that um, Russia is saying that there are Nazis in Ukraine and that may be uh, Russian propaganda, but it, it is also has truth to it. So how do we, I guess, talk to people about about something like that, where it is propaganda, it is Russian, it is a Russian talking point, but it also happens to have truth to it. Do we want to go no. to Matthew Hill? Um, yeah, I, I mean, again, it, it's this kind of idea of, of, of the effort that needs to be put into it and the understanding uh, one assembling a Venn diagram and then, of course, not losing uh, the, the forest because of the trees. And you can see uh, the effectiveness of the propaganda. Well, let me say you just had in, in these last uh, week or two uh, cross border raids by Ukrainian forces uh, into Russia. These are supposedly done by ethnic Russians, volunteer forces. But one of the leaders of the, but they have very real ties to the Ukrainian military. They're actually, I think these guys' day jobs were in the Ukrainian military uh, and they were using American equipment, uh, American vehicles uh, to launch these raids into Russia. Um, you know, and the leader of one of those groups is a very well-defined Nazi. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it, there's no question about that. That type of 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 flagging of him as a Nazi um, certainly helps the Russian propaganda effort, if you will, and propaganda in the sense of getting their side out. Nothing to do with truth or not truth, but just getting people to side with them, right? Getting people to go along with them. Uh, I mean, so and certainly, if you go back and look at say. Uh, how does the Russian public view this war? And now they see these cross-border raids led by a Nazi, which is what Vladimir Putin, when he launched this invasion 15 months ago, said one of the primary objectives of war was to denazify the nation. So this gives some credence to that. That gives some credibility to it. Oh, wow, these Nazis really are going to attack us. Just like, again, my grandfather fought against the Nazis. Now maybe I have to as well. You have these drone attacks that took place uh, you know, in Moscow. You've had attacks all throughout Russia, whether it be assassination attempts, there's been sabotage, train derailments, the Kerch Bridge connecting the Russian mainland to Crimea was blown up. All these different events have occurred that um, only serve to strengthen the will of the Russian people. Uh, just in the same way that our bombings of Vietnam, I mean, we dropped more bombs on Vietnam than we did in the total during World War II. That did nothing to weaken the Vietnamese, right? Uh, if you look at uh, the Russian attacks on Ukraine over the last 15 months, that has done nothing to weaken the will of the Ukrainians. In fact, if you look at public polling and you look where, uh, say, the issue of joining NATO, where before the Russian invasion, the Ukraine was roughly split on, on that issue. Now, uh, 70, 80 percent of Ukrainians believe in joining NATO. Right. I mean, so oftentimes when you do these military actions, uh, you do not have an effect on your enemy like you say you will. You don't weaken their will. You don't you know, you don't denigrate their resolve. You don't push them towards negotiating. In fact, the opposite usually occurs. So I, I think trying to understand the propaganda value of all this, you have to look at who are the uh, who 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 takes the most away from that, and oftentimes the propaganda is for internal consumption, you know, and this notion that if just because something now to answer your question because I realize I realize I really didn't answer your question. Um, the point being though is that yes, there can be things said by the Russians that are true just as there are things said by the Ukrainians or the British or the Americans that are true. But whether or not the focus of that uh, usage is to uh, gain support or just inform is something I think you have to develop an eye for. Mm 
right? So how is that how is that information being utilized? How is it being uh, put forward? How is it being manipulated? And the thing about it too is that so much we only hear one side of the story on these things. So very often you hear about uh, a, you know uh, one side will, will will state how many have killed the other side uh, without mentioning at all how many of their own have been killed. Right. So you you do. You have to continually go back and look at the information, try and glean it from all sides to get an idea, just a, a speck of, of what actually may be occurring. Hmm. That's a good point that Matt just brought up. I had a really intense discussion with a professor at Catholic University recently who maintained that the Ukrainians were winning. And all I did was just a simple, simple comparison of how many Ukrainians, how many Russians, how many time zones, how much lack of time zones how much depth, how little depth. And how can you say that the Ukrainians are winning? Maybe in spirit and elan and verve and passion for the war. After all, you're defending your homeland, but not in terms of fundamentals that truly count. And anyone who maintains that Ukraine is winning or has the potential to win even a Pyrrhic victory is just adding to the nonsense that'll get more people killed. You know, one one thing to point out uh, in the terms of propaganda, it doesn't just flow out to the public. It flows within the governments and between governments. So if you go and you look at the uh, leaks from uh, the Discord leaks, as they're called, the leaks put out by that uh, young man from the Air National Guard up in Massachusetts, uh, a couple of months ago, the kid who put it out on the servers to impress his friend or whatever the story is. Uh, if you look at some of those uh, pages, you'll see there are footnotes. And again, these uh, were, were, were slides that were used to brief the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And, and you'll see there are footnotes in some of these slides that basically say, this information comes from the Ukrainians. We don't believe it. We're changing our methodology. Right. So when you see reports about who is you know, how many Russians have been killed, very often, if you find the source for that, it comes from the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense. Uh, in the same way, too, uh, if you were to look at the Russian information, it's wildly uh, you know, off in terms of what you could kind of gain or glean on your own. In, in the same way, too, this happened all throughout uh, the United States wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, of course, and in Vietnam, the idea of the body count. You know, this idea that somehow you, you you present the data in such a way to show that you're winning, because what matters is the people who are receiving that data, believing it, not whether that data actually has any real, uh, is any real reflection of what's occurring on the battlefield and on the trend of the war. You know, I, I have friends of mine who uh, several years ago, because uh, every year the United States would say that there were 100 Al Qaeda uh, operating in Afghanistan. Uh, and this went on for a better part of two decades, this, this 100 Al-Qaeda. And these guys, sometime around 2012 or so, went through all the different uh, reports from the headquarters in Afghanistan and from Central Command, and they tallied up all the number of people that we killed saying that who we said were, who the U.S. said were Al-Qaeda. And the number just mounted into thousands upon thousands, right, demonstrating that there's no truth to any of this. But the perception is what matters. And who are you trying to perceive that? And in, in Afghanistan, the importance was not actually defeating, to maintain the war there, to keep it going. The importance was not defeating the Taliban on the battlefield. The importance was to keep the American public, more importantly, the American Congress and the American media on the positive side of the war. So you had to demonstrate progress. You had to show that we were winning. You had to show that we were killing people, right? And so that, this is something that's as old as 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 uh, you know, history is in the sense of, of propaganda and reporting back and letting people know how great your victories are. Uh, but it is it, it's something that it's a challenge because if you, if you go and you look at what has occurred in Ukraine, uh, the number of Ukrainians the Russians say they have killed, the number of Russians the Ukrainians said they killed, mathematically it just makes no sense. But also too, this idea that so many people, to Larry's point, don't understand the basics of it. Again, the size of Russia. The fact that they can produce so much, the fact that they have put such an effort in the last 10 years preparing for this war, whether it's to avoid the sanctions, protect themselves financially, or to build out their industrial base so that they're not running out of artillery shells or rockets or missiles, unlike how in the West is unable right now to support the Ukrainian military with enough rockets and artillery shells and missiles.
I mean, so these are the kinds of things I think a lot of people are absent. And there's, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, there's a lot of different explanations for why is the media so poor on this? There's a relationship between the media and the Pentagon, the banks that own everything, uh, the, the fossil fuel companies that can't be denied. But then there's also the very real uh, 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 limitation that you only have so much column space that you have to put something in a two and a half minute uh, television piece. And so I think there's a disservice too in terms of how we deliver media to people that prevents them from knowing or understanding fully what's occurring. Mm -hmm. So we'll start to wrap up on this last question, which is about free speech. And um, th this conference, the purpose of this conference is to sort of reclaim the value of free speech for the left, considering that it is a traditional leftist value, but the, the state of the left today is very much, uh, there's a lot of cancel culture, there's a lot of silencing, censoring, self-censoring. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, not all of our panelists are on the left, but um, it's sort of geared towards having that discussion among leftists who really should be valuing free speech more. So have either of you faced any backlash for being sort of voices of reason on this issue? Have you um, have you encountered any attempts at censorship? And also have you observed colleagues or you know, others around you self-censoring on this? Interesting question for me. <laughs> yes, is the answer. Um, I don't pay much attention to it anymore because. I'm retired. I'm out of any function of government and I don't have any reason to worry about it. I've had the FBI call on me a couple of times. Uh, one time I just about wound up throwing them out of my house because they were very, very unprofessional. Um, and it was absolutely specious what they were claiming about my, uh, my association with Code Pink. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I said to one of them. Uh, interesting conversation there. But I don't feel I don't feel the pressure like I would probably if I were still in government. And I feel for people who want to tell the truth who are still in government. I recommend a book to you by Tom Mueller called Crisis of Conscience, Whistleblowing in an Age of Fraud. And he has a chapter in there on the nuclear industry inside the United States that will frankly scare you to death because the complicity between Department of Energy, Department of Justice, Bechtel Engineering Company, the primary nuclear engineer in America, um, a group that does nuclear waste in America, 95% of it, most of it west of the Mississippi in terms of its disposal, and uh, Hanover and Washington are blossoming Chernobyls. Unquestionably, they are. And the American people know nothing about this, absolutely nothing about it. When I recommend to people that they read the book, many shy away from it for, for that very reason. So, yeah, there's pressure. Right? Look at what's happening to Julian Assange right now. Well, I think we had the fifth Belmarsh Tribunal uh, on 5, 4 March, maybe in Sydney. I went to the one at the National Press Club here in, in, in Washington. I didn't hear a voice at that tribunal that disturbed me in terms of, one, they're telling the real story, and two, they're telling the truth as they saw it, and it was fundamentally my truth, too, and the dangers that it presented to any any government pretending even to be a democracy, as we do. Um, we have a tough time ahead if we're to survive the next 10, 20 years, a really tough time, not just because of nuclear weapons and the climate crisis, but because we are destroying our republic. Mm -hmm. Matthew Hope? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, you see that you see that uh, just in, in trying to get this uh, letter published, and we asked for people to sign on to it. Uh, there were people who agreed with it, but would not sign on to it uh, because it was too much, too soon, too quick. And one of the reasons why we did this letter in the New York Times was to try and open space to to be uh, and, and there are people who are arguing again, like Larry said, there's there's not a dearth of, of of folks out there saying this, but we were trying to create a space in a mainstream uh, uh, publication, getting out of our bubble and into someone else's bubble, uh, so to speak, uh, to show things, to uh, inform, present ideas, thoughts, timelines, context that are left out so often uh 
Um, but this idea of self-censorship, certainly you see that quite a bit. Uh, you see people who are afraid to go just too far. Uh, if Ukraine and military matters are not a person's thing, it's not the organization's thing, why stick your neck out? Why uh, you know, lose any capital you may have on an issue that's not germane to your issues? You know, and this is even within the foreign policy community. So people who won't focus on Asia, say, uh, may not say, speak as forcefully about what's happening in Europe because they feel, well, I'm going to lose space on this. I don't need to stick my neck out on this. This is not my bailiwick. You know, so you, you see that type of self-censorship. You see the very real censorship in the mainstream media, of course. Um, we have had studies after studies. The Intercept just did one last year. Uh, but, you know, really since around 2012, 2013, there's been a dramatic uh, rehandling of how particularly the cable news media handles and, 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 and depicts these wars. And again, uh, since the war in Syria, the war uh, in Afghanistan, the war uh, in Ukraine, you see that the, the studies show that 80 to 90 percent, probably more, uh, of the people who go on the air and pontificate, who talk about these wars, the pundits, uh, either are directly or indirectly paid for by the military industrial complex. Many times they're directly paid for by the Pentagon or the CIA or the State Department through the think tanks they work for, or they're on the or, or they're indirectly on the role of Lockheed or Raytheon or Boeing because those think tanks fund those those uh, weapons companies fund those think tanks, or perhaps they're even on the board of directors for those companies. And of course, those things are never disclosed. And again, we see nine out of 10 people who are talking about these wars being financially dependent upon them. So when they come out and say, the answer is more weapons, more war, we shouldn't be surprised. And of course, the relationship, you know, to, to discuss this, you know, Paul Jay was supposed to be here with us today. And Paul talks about this so well. I know Larry's talked with him before. It's where I learned it from. I learned it from Larry and from Paul. This idea about the connection, the relationship between uh, the, 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 the banks that own 95% or the principal shareholders in 95% of the S&P 500, uh, right? So you have this relationship that exists then because between the media companies, between the arms companies, between the fossil fuel companies, because they're all owned by the five, same five or six banks, uh, you know, via them being their principal shareholders. So you have that as well. Uh, but then you also have the desire for patriotism. And the best story I can relate is a number of years ago, I met Michael Steele, who was the former Republican National Committee uh, chairman. And if you remember Michael Steele, he was always putting his foot in his mouth, always causing controversy, always making other Republicans upset with him. And uh, I spoke to him. And he said, you know what? The most grief I ever got was when I agreed with Barack Obama on the Afghan war. And this would have been in 2011. Uh, I believe summer 2011, and Barack Obama said, we need to begin pulling our troops out of Afghanistan. And Michael Steele said, yes, I agree. We need to get out of the war. And he said he had dozens of Republican members of Congress from the House and the Senate call him and say, yes, you're absolutely right, but you can't say that, right? I mean, so there is this underlying motif that exists that, the, 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 that you're going to be unpatriotic. You're not going to support the troops. We just came through Memorial Day which is just one uh, a propaganda explosion for militarism. Uh, so I, I think, you know, understanding all the various aspects that lead into this censorship uh, is important. But again, I'll go back to what I said earlier. It's forums like this. It's a technology ha we have. It's the idea of where is that technology going to go? That gives me hope that we can have a better educated more well, uh, a, a better informed public than we do now. All right. Well, let's leave it at that for today. Um, thank you both so much. It was a wonderful discussion. And I think it gave our viewers hopefully a lot to think about. And I really appreciate both of you coming on here and talking to us today, but also just consistently advocating for the truth and for de-escalation. I mean, Considering that some people didn't want to sign, I think that really shows it takes a certain moral courage to put that out there. So thank you again, and we'll leave it at that for today. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Sasha.